go ahead. Ani, hi there. Thanks for tuning into today's event and apologies for the delay. Just one more chance to, to refer to the now sort of cliche expression, COVID. Uh, my name is Jamie Duncan and I'm a junior fellow at Massey College where I support some of the college's efforts related to truth and reconciliation. Today, I'm really pleased to introduce Darren Waibenga, who's a traditional knowledge and land use coordinator with the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. His talk is entitled, The Mississaugas of the Credit, We Are Still Here. I've been grateful to get to know some of our partners at the Mississauga of the Credit First Nation over the past academic year. And if one central insight has come out of these relationships, though there have been many, it's that truth comes before reconciliation. I hope that today's event can support the spirit of that sentiment. While today's event is in a sense all about the land on which Massey College and the University of Toronto operate, it's still important to recognize from the outset that for thousands of years, this has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit River. Today, this meeting place is still home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we at Massey College are grateful to have the opportunity to live, work, and play on this land. While many of us will be tuning in from Toronto, many more may be physically present elsewhere. I encourage everyone to use the chat function to, where applicable, share whose land you're on. And lastly, please feel free to use the chat function to post questions throughout Darren's presentation. We're gonna come back to them during our question and answer period after the event. And without further ado, I'm very pleased to pass the screen over to Darren. Well, thank you very much for the, uh, for the kind uh, introduction. Ani Bozo, I bring you greetings from the Mississauga of the Credit First Nation. And it's my pleasure to be here with you today to talk a little bit about the history of our First Nation and especially as how it relates to the, our treaty lands and territory in the greater Horseshoe area. Uh, I entitled my talk, uh, We're Still Here, because often as a First Nation people, we seem forgotten or invisible on the land, despite the fact we've been around for many, many years. Now I'm gonna to go to screen share right now, and if I do that correctly, Let's see if I'm doing, oh, there we go, I think. One more thing. There we go. Hopefully that works. And right now you should be seeing the logo from our First Nation. I was gonna say, we've been around for a long time, but we just had recently had a name change, a slight name change. We used to call ourselves the Mississaugas of the new credit First Nation. Uh, but just recently, uh, probably within the last year or two, some of our band members said, why do we call ourselves the Mississaugas of the new credit First Nation? There's nothing new about us. We're a very old and ancient people. And so that resonated with the membership. And just in the last, oh, I suppose a year, uh, it's, we now call ourselves the Mississaugas of the credit First Nation. Uh, and uh, that's what we see reflected on our logo now. Just before I go a little too far into the talk, I uh, just so you know, Mississaugas of the Credit, uh, the central uh, symbol is the eagle because at one time, most of our band membership consisted of members of the eagle clan, Magizi clan, we call it. The three fires you see there symbolize that we are part of the three fires confederacy, the Ottawa, Ojibwe and Potawatomi people. And uh, the, blue in our, the blue writing in our logo signifies our ties to water as a Mississauga people. So we've got to go back in our history before I can get you to Toronto. I'm just going to skip that slide. Uh, we were first encountered by the French about 1634. In this location, you see us, we're on the north shore of Lake Huron in Georgian Bay. The French encountered us in 1634 on the Mississauga River. It's about, I think, about 100 uh, kilometers or so uh, east of Sault Ste. Marie, and that's where the encounter first took, took place. And they encountered us living a very, of course, traditional lifestyle. Our people camped on the rivers and streams flowing into large bodies of water, in this case, Georgian Bay and Lake Huron. And we spent much of our time fishing in the spring and fall seasons. 
and just gathering and hunting, gathering and moving about the land in the other seasons. Like I said, a very traditional lifestyle. But of course, when the French came, when the French arrived, we began, began a trading relationship. We didn't trade directly with the uh, French. We traded through the Huron-Wendat people. If you see them here in Southern Ontario. And they basically controlled the fur trade through to the French along the St. Lawrence. Uh, so, like I said, we're still in Northern Ontario at this time, but now we got to wonder, how do we get to Southern Ontario? How do we get to the Toronto area? And that is also part of the story of the fur trade. We move into Southern Ontario by means of military conquest in the late 1600s. Uh, the early in the mid part of the 1600s were a time of terrible warfare and upheaval for Southern Ontario. As you see on the map, the traditional people at the time, the Wendat, the Huron Wendat, the Neutral, uh, the Mississaugas, the Tobacco Indians or the Patan people. And that Southern Ontario, a great fur trading region, and the Haudenosaunee people, they're in what is New York State. You can just barely see it's the Finger Lake region. And they're trading with the British on the eastern seaboard. The problem with the Haudenosaunee at that time is they've been trading with the British and they had begun to run out of the beaver fur pelts. Uh, and so where better to find the pelts but move into the territory held by the Wendats and the Neutrals and so on. And so 1649, 1650, they move into Southern Ontario and drive out the Wendat, they drive out the neutral, and they take control of the area in Southern Ontario. The unfortunate thing about that is that the Haudenosaunee continue their movements to the north and run into the territory of the Mississaugas and our allies, other Algonquian speaking people. And really you have this vast period of conflict, like I said, known as the Beaver Wars. So as the Haudenosaunee invade into our territory and to Northern Ontario in general, the people begin to push back. And this are the routes we took to push the Haudenosaunee out of Southern Ontario. So about 1618, pardon me, about 1685, our attacks uh, commence into Southern Ontario. And you can see through the red, red uh, lines, the red arrows, how we did it. Some of our Mississauga people went down the Trent Severn waterway system. And you can see that on the map here. And you might know those people today as the people of uh, Scugog, of Curve Lake, of uh, Alderville, Hiawatha First Nation, they're still there today. And our people, the Mississaugas of the Credit Ancestors, came down the Toronto Caring Place Trail and drove out the Haudenosaunee people out of this end of uh, Lake Ontario. And uh, we suddenly found ourselves at the end of that period of warfare. And we usually use the Great Peace of Montreal. That occurred in 1701. We usually use that as our period that ends the war formally. It was a, it was a peace treaty brokered by the French between uh, the Anishinaabe people, including the Mississaugas and the Ottawas and so on, that brokered the peace between us and the Haudenosaunee people. Anyway, at that period of conflict, about 16, uh, 1685, 1690, we're not 100 percent sure of the dates, the Mississaugas of the Credit Ancestors found themselves occupying about 4 million acres of land at the western end of Lake Ontario. And you can see this is our boundary, this large yellow line that you see here. So it runs from the Rouge River westward up until we get to about the headwaters of the Thames River down the waters of the Thames, all the way down to Lake Erie and Long Point, follow Lake Erie shoreline around the Niagara River, then Lake Ontario. And that basically outlines our territory. And just like we did in Northern Ontario, we always lived on the flats 
uh, of major uh, rivers and creeks flowing into large bodies of water. So when we're at this end of Lake Ontario, we lived on 12 Mile Creek. Uh, you might know it, that as Bronte Creek, uh, 16 Mile Creek, the Credit, uh, the Humber, uh, the Don, the Etobicoke. Once again, we were living a very traditional lifestyle, hunting, fishing, fishing, gathering, trading. We traded with the French until they were uh, bested by the British in 1760. And then once they were bested by the British, we traded earnestly with the, uh, with the British people. And so a very prosperous time for us as we engaged in trade. There's a few flies in the ointment. For those of you familiar with history, you'll know of uh, Pontiac's rebellion. For example, we're gonna gloss over that a little bit. Uh, but overall, generally in terms of our people, we were, it was kind of a golden age for us. We, we occupied, controlled and exercised stewardship over this end of uh, Lake Ontario. So a vast, vast territory. And everything was going, like I said, very well for us until the time of the American Revolution. And that is really the beginning of our problems. But, oh, I forgot to mention one thing. Uh, we made our principal home in that territory that you see here on a creek we called the Missanihi. Uh, it's, uh, its name means uh, the Trusting Creek, if you want to think of it in a chip way. Uh, the Trusting Creek, it later became known as the Credit River, and we became known as the Credit River Indians. It was our principal home. We met there together as a people to hunt, uh, pardon me, to fish, to uh, engage ourselves, uh, reacquaint ourselves with each other, to uh, find uh, spouses for ourselves, to engage in ceremony, to engage in games. Uh, it was a great time of social socialization for the people. But anyway, the Missanihi becomes known as the Credit River because the French set up a trading post very nearby and they were in the habit of extending credit to our people. So if some of our Mississauga ancestors went to the trading post in the off season and they needed a new pot or perhaps a musket, they would ask the trader could we have this trade good? Could we have that pot? And the trader would say, yes, uh, you can have it, but uh, make sure you pay us back uh, when you bring in the next season's catch of furs. And we would do that. They would extend us credit. And uh, the Miss and He became known as the Credit River. And we became known as the Mississaugas of the Credit. And so that's how we get our name, the Mississaugas of the Credit. So anyway, back to the, uh, we're gonna get back to the American Revolution in a second, but uh, the American Revolution was a time of vast upheaval for us. Because of course, if you're gonna stay loyal to King George and those American colonies, you were in for a tough time. Uh, if as a loyalist, you could be thrown in jail, your property confiscated. Uh, all kinds of nasty things could happen to you. But if you could stay loyal and move, move into the king's territory, you could be granted land. And who had land to grant, who had land to spare, but the First Nations people of Southern Ontario. Now, I put this belt up here. This predates the American Revolution a little bit. It's called the the Silver Covenant Chain of Friendship. Uh, and we acquainted also with the Treaty of Niagara. And basically, it's the rules the British made for themselves that uh, allowed them to acquire the lands from the First Nations people in Southern Ontario. Uh, before we had this agreement, uh, the British uh, I should say, dealt, especially down, down below Southern Ontario in the uh, Ohio Valley region, had expanded westward and it, 
and had run into problems with the Western tribes. And that included partaking, taking of, of their lands. And that raised uh, a great deal of animosity. And so the British Crown decided that they had to find a way to, to uh, deal with the First Nations and the use of their lands. And so they came up with the Royal Proclamation of 1763. And that's kind of memorialized in this treaty belt and the Treaty of Niagara. And you can see on it, there's two figures on it. One uh, represents a British person or the crown. The other represents the, uh, the First Nations of, the, of, the, of the, uh, North America. And the deal is that we're going to coexist on the land in peace and friendship. And it also recognizes for us that uh, the British sees the first, the first Nations as actual nations, and they recognize the sovereignty of the First Nations over the lands in which they occupy. And so now once again, bringing it back to the American Revolution, when they need land on which to settle the loyalists, they must acquire the land from the First Nations that occupy it. And for, the, for those of us in uh, the Lake Ontario region, that refers primarily to the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. The first treaty the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation engages in with the Crown is for this red strip of land around here. You see it as the Niagara River. It's a strip of land, six miles uh, or six kilometers deep on the western bank of the Niagara River, and it's meant to meant as a, a portage around Niagara Falls, of course, and it's also meant as agricultural agricultural land, so the British could uh, feed their troops farther west. And the, and the British were able to obtain that land for the grand total of a few trade goods and three hundred British coats. That was the price. Now. And the, and the British at, at the time thought they were pulling a fast one on the Mississaugas because Sir Guy, uh, Sir Guy Johnson, he is the superintendent of Indian Affairs at the time, uh, said to some of his cronies, I really didn't pay the Mississaugas too much because those coats that I gave them, I was going to give them to the Mississaugas anyway for them staying loyal to us during the revolution. So. The Crown thought they were pulling a fast one on the Mississaugas. We, on the other hand, it, it was fortunate for us because it showed us, and I suppose it reinforced the British too, that they recognized the Mississaugas of the credit as the rightful occupiers, stewards, and uh, uh, I suppose I don't like the term owners, but owners at the west uh, of the lands at the western end of Lake Ontario. So the second treaty we engaged in, let's go back a little bit, is this large purple blotch that you see here. And that's what we like to call our Between the Lakes Treaty. And it was for a very special group of loyalists that that treaty was uh, entered into. You'll remember that Mississaugas of the Credit Ancestors helped to drive out the Haudenosaunee. You know them today as the Six Nations or the Iroquois out of Southern Ontario at the end of the Beaver Wars. Well, the Haudenosaunee, the Six Nations had fought on behalf of the British during the American Revolution and the British had lost and had really made no provision for their Haudenosaunee allies during that conflict. So, Joseph Brandt, a leader of the large, a large group of the Haudenosaunee people, petitioned Governor Haldimand of, uh, of Canada to grant them land for their loyalty in, term, uh, for, for in terms of the American Revolution. And so Joseph Brandt, there's a picture of him there, selects a strip of land, he'd like a strip of land on the Grand River, six miles on either side of the Grand River from its mouth to its head. But in order to get that land to grant Joseph Brandt, 
Governor Haldeman has to enter in a deal with the Mississaugas of the credit so that the uh, grant to Joseph Brandt can take place. And so treaty number three is signed. We call it the Between the Lakes Treaty. It's uh, negotiated in 1784. The strip of land is granted to the Haudenosaunee people and Joseph Brandt that very same year. And they move in with 2,000. And Joseph Brandt moves in with 2,000 followers on that tract of land. And so that's how the Iroquois, the Six Nations Confederacy, is here in Southern Ontario today. And uh, it's gratifying to know that uh, we could be a help in uh, relocating them here in Southern Ontario. So that was the second treaty we engaged in with the Crown. And you'll see on this map that we engaged in a total of eight treaties with the Crown. And really, it was disastrous for our people. Uh, that between the Lakes Treaty for one was about 3 million acres of land that uh, we parted with. And we, we really thought that we were sharing the land. We didn't have this concept of uh, ownership the British did. When the British went to us with the early treaties, well, with all the treaties actually, they thought they were actually purchasing the ran, land outright. It was lock, stock and barrel theirs, just like a modern real estate deal. Uh, I like to call it the sole proprietorship of land. Well, First Nations people and the Mississaugas of the Credit, specifically in this case, thought we were sharing the land, that we would have the settlers live among us and we would carry on our traditional lifestyle. We would still carry out our hunting, our fishing, our gathering and our trading. Things would go on pretty much as normal. But we found out fairly quickly that that was not the case. We suddenly found ourselves in dire difficulties. We could not move about the land as we once did. Uh, we were confronted with angry farmers that saw us as trespassers. We, cons we confronted uh, field. Uh, our fields were fenced in and we were blocked from free movement, we found plowed fields, we found tracts of forests cleared, we found uh, even fisheries in some of our creeks along the 16 and 12 and Etobicoke and so on being decimated. Our traditional economy collapsed and so did our population. As a result, uh, when we made that first treaty way back in 1781, the Mississaugas of the Credit Ancestors amounted to about 500 people for that vast tract of land. Uh, 1790, we're down to 400. Uh, by the time we get to 1800, 1800, uh, we're down to 300 people. By the time we make our final treaties, treaty number 22 and treaty number 23, we're down to about 200 people. And we think we're on the verge of extinction and so does the crown. Uh, matter of fact, the last couple of treaties we make, this large tract of land here, we call the adjutants treaty. Uh, we talked to the superintendent at the time, a man by the name of Colonel Claus, and he approached us asking us to use that land because already we were sickly, our population was decimated, we were disease ridden with plenty of diseases we knew, we did not know how to combat. They were new diseases to us, uh, newer on the brink of starvation. So basically he asks us if we will grant the land to the crown and they will give us food stuffs and trade goods in order to keep body and soul together. And once we parted with this large piece of land, all we had left were these little reserves, and you see them in yellow and in brown there at uh, 12 Mile Creek, 16 Mile Creek, and the Credit River, two reserves here. 
and we finally ended up parting with those for uh, a pittance. Uh, matter of fact, we have actually claims against the Crown for those today. The Crown promised to uh, sell those lands on our behalf and then use them to support us. And uh, we've never, even to this very day, have an accounting of, of the money. The other thing, of course, that was promised us was uh, they would educate us according to uh, the standards of the time. And they would, uh, I suppose I would say, inculcate in us the uh, Christian religion at that time. So it's not a good deal. We think we're on the verge of extinction. The Crown thinks we're on the verge of extinction. And we were desperate when we made those final deals with the Crown. But fortunately, one of our band members came to our rescue. And that's this gentleman. Uh, Kaka Wabanabe is his Ojibwe name. It means uh, sacred feathers. Uh, we know him today as the Reverend Peter Jones. He's born in 1802, and he's got a very interesting lineage. His mother is Tuba Bananaque. She's a Mississauga of the Credit woman. She's living on the Credit River, and she also has a uh, has a, 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 uh, lives with her larger extended family also at Burlington Heights. And that's where Peter's born. His father is a man by the name of Augustus Jones, and he's the deputy provincial surveyor. So he's the product of a mixed marriage. And I don't like the term marriage. Peter always claimed his parents were married, but Augustus Jones was actually married legally to a Six Nations woman. That was a legal marriage. His uh, his dalliance, his relationship with Tuba Bananaque, I don't think was terribly legal by the standards of the day. So anyway, Peter is raised with his mother's people. Augustus goes off and lives with his other family, but Peter is raised with his mother's people. His uh, grandfather playing a large a large role in that education. He learns everything you need to know about being a good, a good First Nations boy. He's learning hunting, fishing. He's learning tracking. He goes on a vision quest. Uh, he knows all the social norms, the mores. Uh, for all intents and purposes, he is a good First Nations Indigenous boy. Uh, but the problem is, remember, the Credit River people think they're going to be extinct. The Crown thinks they're going to become extinct. And Augustus Jones, the boy's father, thinks the band is going to be extinct. So what he decides to do is take Peter away. I don't mean take away in a violent sense. I just mean move him away from his... Uh, mother's people and give him a settler education uh, in Stony Creek. And that's where Peter goes, gets a settler education. He and a younger brother, uh, they learn how to read, write, do arithmetic. They learn a trade. Uh, the one boy becomes a surveyor. Peter actually learns to become a brick maker, which is really not, uh, well, not exactly the most uh, fitting job for a vibrant, virile First Nations boy at the time. But nevertheless, that's what he is. He learns, like I said, reading, writing, arithmetic, and he's set up perfectly to deal with the government and the settlers at the time. So about 1822, 1823, I should say, it is, it is 1823, he goes to a camp meeting in Ancaster, Ontario. If you're not familiar with camp meetings, they're religious events, and this one was put on by the Methodists, where there's a lot of preaching, singing, worship, and trying to convert people to Christianity. Peter goes, and he has a conversion experience, and he decides to become a Methodist, and he takes to it like a duck to water, and he soon ventures out into missionary work. He teaches at 
to the local mission village at a place called Davisville, just outside of Brantford. And uh, he decides that the way to save his people from extinction, extinction is to do two things. One, convert them to Christianity. And to second of all, educate them. Read, get them to read, write, do arithmetic, and, and uh, also educate them in the ways of agriculture. It's his hope that he can get the people to deal with the settlers on a living, level playing field. They'll be able to understand each other. And he does. By about 1824, and definitely 1825, most of the Credit River Mississaugas are converted to Methodism. And I don't think it was too hard a sell for Peter Jones to do. The Mississaugas had realized that the old ways were not working for them. They were disease ridden, they were impoverished. Uh, like I said, their economy had collapsed. The old the old Manitous that they had once tried to form, that they had once had a relationship with that helped them in their lives, were no longer there seemingly to help them. Uh, the settlers that they did see were living in much better circumstances than they were. So I don't think it was a hard sell for Peter Jones to convert the people to Christianity. So like I said, by about 1825, the vast majority of the people were converted to Christianity and of Methodist persuasion. So much so that with the help of the government in 1826, he is actually able to form a mission village. And this is a map of the Credit River. You see the Credit River going through the central tract of land. This uh, land here in the odd shape outline is Treaty 22 lands and Treaty 23 lands. He's able to form a mission village right here on the Credit River. And uh, he succeeds in a multitude of ways. Actually, not he succeeds, but Mississaugas of the credit succeed in transforming their lives spectacularly. I'm, I'm proud of this even today when I think about it. In the span of about 21 years, and that's the life of the Mission Village, they, they change their lives completely. They adapt to a new religion. And like I said, just like Peter took to the, his new religion, like a duck to water, so do our people. Uh, they, they don't drink anymore. They devote themselves to, of all things, uh, church and prayer meetings and getting the good life. That's what they want. And it was a complete transformation. Uh, the people move into the Christian Mission Village, 1826. They can carry everything they have with them on their backs, literally. Because remember, we're a hunting gathering people. We move throughout the land. Everything was on our backs. We move into the Christian Mission Village. We're no longer living on wigwams, in wigwams, on the flats of uh, the Credit River, or the 16 Mile Creek or the 12 Mile Creek. We're living in settler log cabins. Many of them built by our, by, with our own hands. Uh, the government helped build the first 20 cabins and uh, we built many more the longer we lived there. And so, so there's a change in lifestyle right there. Uh, let me just see. So that's a, a bit of the buildings. Uh, we had a chapel. We had a hospital. We had a church. We had a school. School, very important to us. Uh, most of our young people, by about 1830, they're reading, they're writing, they're doing arithmetic. Uh, and they're doing it quite well. Many of our early band members go off to uh, places like uh, Upper Canada College of all things. And so we're getting, getting 
well educated at the time. We were even getting an education that's uh, better than our settler neighbors because we always had a school teacher at our, at our mission village. If you look to the settler population around us, they only had teachers around when they could afford to put up a schoolhouse and actually hire a teacher. That was not the case at the Credit River Mission Village. Matter of fact, many of our young students went on themselves to become missionaries and teachers. And so there's this, uh, how'd you say it? There's this, this growth where uh, we became uh, more enlightened and we passed the message, we passed the gift on of the gospel and of education. Uh, so those were, some of the transformation, we, we changed our way of dress. This is from the cold water reserve at the time, but they're, they're like us, they're Mississauga people, they're Ojibwe people, and we're no longer, of course, living, living with uh, typical First Nation clothes. We're not wearing uh, breech cloths and wrapping ourselves in blankets and, and skins and so on. Here we are, we're wearing coats, we're wearing pants, we're wearing shirts, hats, everything. Uh, so a complete transformation in terms of clothing. Uh, Sir Francis uh, Bondhead, if you remember him, the governor of Upper Canada comes to our village in uh, 1837 just to inspect, inspect us. And he's amazed at what he finds. He looks inside our homes. He sees tables and chairs and reading with cups and, uh, plates and uh, knives and forks and spoons and sauce, you know, a complete transformation that way. Uh, so very, very amazing. Uh, prayer meetings, like I said, every night. Uh, very, very uh, strict. Look, if you look at our farms, uh, we, we took to agriculture too. And we're not talking here planting beans, corn, and squash, uh, the typical Indian, uh, Indian crops. We're talking about oat, oats, uh, wheat, barley, the cash crops of the time. So that's a major transformation. We still gardened, but now we're into cash crops. Uh, we learned all about animal husbandry. When we moved into Credit River Reserve, by the Credit River Mission Village, the only domestic animal we had was the dog. That was it. Man's best friend was our best friend too. And that was all we had. But when we moved to the Mission Village, we learn about horses, pigs, sheep, oxen, chickens. Uh, matter of fact, uh, the first domestic animal that we actually had at the Credit River was a chicken. And uh, the lady that was uh, raising them did so because she wanted to uh, resemble and make some money like some of her uh, settler neighbors did. So there was this thought that, yes, we could be prosperous too if we move from that traditional lifestyle. It wasn't easy moving from a traditional lifestyle. Some of our people opposed it. Some of our people could not handle life at the Mission Village and moved elsewhere because they still wanted to retain some, uh, some of the traditional ways, so much so, like I said, they moved away. Some people, my great-great-grandfather uh, among them, a man by the name of Lawrence Herkimer and uh, his brother William, wanted to, the best of both worlds, wanted to retain some of their Anishinaabe, their Mississauga, their Ojibwe ways, and uh, wanted also to retain the uh, settler ways and retain some of the more settler ways that they were learning. And so it brought friction into, uh, into, the, uh, into the community. How do you raise children? If you know anything about uh, First Nation child rearing practices, we're not exactly the strict disciplinarian types. We tend to, in those days especially, to let our children learn by experience. But all of a sudden now, uh, with the advent of Christianity in the community, okay, uh, 
there were stricter rules to be applied to children. And uh, so there was much more discipline, even to the point of coercing them to behave by, uh, 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 I guess, I, I, spanking them at time, which is really something uh, unheard of for First Nation people. There's this whole concept of land ownership. Uh, uh, many of our people at that time still thought, yes, we, we, we share the land, we retain it communally. But some of the First Nations people said, no, we own the land separately. And that was separately like the uh, settlers do. So that was a bit of a problem too, this whole concept of land ownership. But like I said, a complete transformation. So we learned about farming. We lived a new lifestyle in terms of domestic arrangements. Uh, and for heaven's sake, we even became business people which surprises me. Not only did we have locksmiths, uh, pardon me, blacksmiths, uh, shoemakers, uh, coopers, and so on in our village, we also used some of our money, meager as it was, to build a schooner and uh, use it to sail about uh, Lake Ontario. It was called the credit chief of all things. And it was used to transport lumber uh, along, along the great, uh, along Lake Ontario. So well, a complete transformation. So in the span of about oh, 25 years, uh, we went from hunters and gatherers and fishermen and not doing that very well at the end, I might say, we made that complete transformation to, uh, to agriculturalists and uh, I guess I would say entrepreneurs too. So, you know, but there's a fly in the ointment. By the way, that's another picture of, uh, of the Credit River Mission, another viewpoint. But there's a fly in the ointment. Our village is successful. We've cleared a couple thousand acres of land, planted our, our crops. Uh, we have these nice homes. The problem we faced was there's diminishing resources around our land base. Uh, after we lived there for a while, our, our wood is diminished. One of our chiefs says we can't even, or said, uh, we can't even warm ourselves anymore. There's a scarcity of wood. Uh, we're still fishing, by the way. The salmon is becoming scarce because people are building mills along the Credit River. And of course, mills dump a lot of things into rivers, creeks, and uh, the salmon are just not as plentiful as they once were. And they're even hindered from moving upstream to where our village was located. So that's a bit of a problem. Another problem is that the settlers are coming closer and closer to our mission village. And remember, we're strict Methodists. And I don't know what you know about Method Methodism. It's the United Church today. But Methodism in those days was not a religion with a lot of laughs in it. Uh, and we thought we thought the settlers were bad examples for our young people. Here we were at the Mission Village trying to be pious and upright, but the settlers drank, uh, they swore, uh, they danced. Oh my goodness, heaven, heavens, Betsy, the settlers danced. Now, of course, nowadays that stuff is no big deal. But for people, I suppose, transforming their lives and trying to embrace a whole new worldview, it was. So that was a problem for us then. The other problem we had was we could not get title to our lands. Even though we'd improved the lands, we'd set up a mission village, uh, we faced the problem that, we, that First Nation people First Nations people face today, I might add, it's nothing new to us, is that we cannot get title to our lands. Uh, we live on our lands today. Here I am sitting on the new credit First Nation. Uh, I have a plot of land and I get a certificate of possession, which basically means I can use it. That's all it means. I cannot do whatever I want with it. I cannot just sell it to anybody I wish. I have to, settle, I have to settle, uh, sell it actually to another band member if the case goes on. But anyway, 
we can't get title to our lands. We want title to our lands because we fear if we don't get title, the government can take that land from us at any time and give it to the settlers. That's such a worry for us. We send, let me go back a few pages. Now, we send Peter Jones, Reverend Peter Jones at this time, we send him to visit Queen Victoria. He makes it all the way to Queen Victoria and he gets an audience with her. And uh, I, I like this story. He goes before Queen Victoria, but before he goes, Lord Glenelg, the advisor at the time to the queen, tells him that he should wear his Indian costume to go visit the queen. And Peter Jones was a bit aghast at that because here his people had moved on their they're dressing like settlers, and you can see he's dressed very much like a typical, uh, you know, eight, uh, early 19th century clergyman. He's dressed well. He, he wants to show his people have moved on. They've changed their lives, and yet he's asked to go see Queen Victoria in his, uh, as he calls it, his Indian costume. He does, he sees Queen Victoria and she writes about him in her journal and she tells him you should get title to your land. And she sends out the instructions that the Mississaugas of the credit should get title to their lands. And, uh, but really it never gets really, it never gets carried out. Let's just face it. The uh, the colonial government of Upper Canada at the time was not willing. So it does make you wonder how much power really does the monarch carry, especially in those days. And I suppose there's even less nowadays. But in any case, so 1847, the unthinkable happens. It happens elsewhere where the crown moves the indigenous people off their land. It happens to us, the sales of the lands at the Credit River Mission and Reserve are put up for sale in 1847 and were about to be homeless. We looked elsewhere, places to go. We looked at the Owen Sound area. We know it as Saugeen, found the land too rocky because by now we learned how to be agriculturalists. We knew how to farm and do it well. And the fact of the matter was, there's not enough groundwater at Saugeen for us. Uh, uh, there is, the land is rocky. And so we said to the crown, we can't move there. Uh, we can't farm. We could not even feed ourselves. It, it's impossible. We can't move. But nevertheless, the land was put up for sale and uh, we're going to be homeless. Uh, but the wonderful thing about us, remember, in the end of the Beaver Wars, we drove out the Haudenosaunee people, the Six Nations people. Then in Treaty Number no. Three, uh, we reached, we made the treaty with the Crown so that the Haudenosaunee people, with Joseph Brandt, could move on a tract of land uh, uh, around the Grand River. Well, they heard of our plight, and in 1847, when our lands were put up for sale, they said. Why don't you come and live on a corner of, uh, of our lands? Let me just go back again here. So here's the reserve currently, by the way, on this map. So why don't you come? We invite you to come and live with us on a corner of our holdings. And so by this time, the Six Nations have been reduced to a tract of land about this big. And they asked us to live here. They did it because they remembered what we had done for them. And so we did, we took them up on their offer and we moved to what is now new credit. And nowadays, at, nowadays and back then, it consists of 6,000 acres of land. And uh, if you look at this map here, this block of land here is situated in Brant County. And this block of land here is situated in Holdeman County, 6,000 acres. Uh, about, uh, about 244 of us, 240 moved here 
in 1847. And boy, it took quite a while for us to move. Some of our people had to go back and forth to the Credit River Mission Village two or three times to gather all their materials. Remember when I said we moved into the Mission Village years earlier, we could carry everything on our back. But when we left in 1847, we had to go back and we had to carry, bring with us to the new settlement, the cows, the pigs, the chickens, the household furniture, the household goods. Uh, we learned a lot about materialism too, I'm afraid. And so it, so it took us a bit of effort to uh, move to the new location. Of course, the new location became known as the, as, uh, the new credit uh, reserve. We were never able to replicate what we had at the Credit River Mission. We did not put up a hospital. Uh, we did not put up the mills. Uh, of course, uh, we built a school. We build a church and we build a council house, but we're never quite as successful uh, as we were at the Credit River Mission Village. And I think a big thing for us was that we were alienated from water. If you remember back to that first map way back in Northern Ontario, Georgian Bay and Lake Huron, there we were camped at the, uh, the flats, the rivers. And we did the same when we moved into Southern Ontario. Uh, you know, flats of uh, rivers and creeks again. Well, we move to the new credit and we have two small creeks flowing through our 6,000 acres. And I mean small creeks. We're not going to build uh, uh, mills. We're not going to float a schooner like we once did. We had to sell the schooner, by the way. We're not going to build mills. Uh, but we're going to focus on farming, and that we do very well. And we're known as great farmers up until about the 1900s. And by about the 1900s, several, well, a couple of things come into play. One is the fact that 244 people moved to uh, New Credit, but after a generation, you have to divide the land, and your sons are going to... Uh, to, uh, going to inherit uh, what you had. So by the time we get a couple generations in, the farms get smaller and smaller and they're no longer able to support a family. So that's a problem. We start falling behind in that regard. Uh, the second uh, problem in regards to agriculture is there's always developments in agriculture. There's always new tricks to the trade. There's always new technology, whether it's tractors or, or plows or some sort of implement. And here's the problem. Like I said, as a First Nation, we do not own our own land. And our people face that problem. All of a sudden they see new technology, uh, the new farmer, the new combine, the new whatever. And they cannot get a loan at a financial institution to purchase that new technology. They can't own a land, so they can't put something, they can't own land, so they can't put the land up for collateral. They can't get loans. And so we fall behind in agricultural that agriculture that way. And matter of fact, in the early 1900s, it was not unusual to see some of our people still, still uh, uh, using uh, horses and uh, you know the manual plows to uh, break up the land and so on, not unusual at all. So that presents a problem for us. We, we fall behind and once again, we're being uh, hit with, uh, with poverty. So many of our young people, and this is a problem we still face today, have to go elsewhere to make a living have to go elsewhere to keep body and soul together. So many of our people go to nearby communities of, uh, of uh, Hagersville, of course, that you see it on the map there. We have large quarries in Hagersville, if you're not familiar with the, with the area, large quarries. Uh, they go to Simcoe, they go to Brantford, they go to Hamilton to go make a living. It's not actually until World War 
One, that we're actually to make a go of agriculture again. And that's because we sent so many soldiers off to World War I. The government allowed First Nations soldiers to obtain uh, soldier settlement loans. And a lot of our people put those loans into agricultural uh, implement, implements and so on. And we were able to make a go of uh, farming again. But that's uh, been a struggle. And speaking of World War II, uh, it's a bit of a, of a watershed moment for us. Uh, I like this story. Here's a man by the name of Cameron Brandt. He's one of our best and brightest new credit band members at the turn of the century. Born in 1887, he's the, uh, the great grandson of Chief Joseph Brandt, the Six Nations War Chief. But Brandt himself is a new credit uh, band member. He's educated very well by our, sta by our standards. He attends the New Credit Methodist Church, or now it's known as the New Credit Church. Uh, he, uh, he goes to Hagersville High School which didn't happen too often, but it did. So he's very well educated. He goes off to the military academy in London, Ontario for a time. He's, uh, he's a very, very bright man, but he sees no future here living on the First Nation because of course, agriculture has collapsed, so you can't make a living farming. So he casts about, what is he going to do? He decides after his marry, he gets married uh, to a, uh, a settler woman. He decides that he's going to move to Hamilton and make a living there as a sheet metal worker. But before he does that, he wants to make a good go of it. He wants to be a success in Hamilton. He wants to enfranchise himself. And when I say enfranchise, that means uh, means with uh, uh, decline his First Nation status, part with his First Nation status, and become a settler with the full rights of uh, voting and so on. So he will cease to become a First Nations band member when he does that. And he does that because he can get a lump sum, uh, a tidy little sum of money from the band funds, because he's leaving now, he's going to take his share of the band funds and go use it to, uh, to make a whole new life for himself in Hamilton. But before he can do that, World War I intervenes and he goes off to fight in the war and he's killed. To me, it's a very sad story. It's sad because we lost one of our best and brightest in, uh, in World War I. But what also makes me sad is that he had to enfranchise himself, uh, or I should say he was going to enfranchise himself. He never quite made it because the war intervened. He was going to enfranchise himself to make a living. And uh, to me, that's disappointing. Uh, but that was his best chance. And it's something we face today, not so much the enfranchisement. Uh, no one I know denounces the First Nation status anymore, thankfully. And the government has made rules regarding that, but uh, many of our First Nations people do still have to go elsewhere uh, to make a living, uh, even today. And so we still cast about for jobs in, uh, you know, Hamilton, Toronto, so on. I myself was a school teacher for 20 years, but I never taught here on the First Nation. I had to go elsewhere to uh, make a living. My boss at uh, my department here is a man by the name of Mark LaForm. His uh, brother is uh, Justice Harry LaForm, uh, judge on the appellate court, retired justice. He had to go elsewhere to uh, practice law. Uh, another one of our band members, a journalist, a man by the name of Walter Secord, he had to go elsewhere to practice uh, journalism. and. Uh, and had ended up in Australia, of all things, in the Australian Senate. Uh, so our people have to arrange themselves far and wide to, uh, to continue to make a living even to this day. So the, the problems that Captain or Cameron Brandt faced, uh, we still face very much uh, today. But we are 
and innovative people. We've, we've made transformations before. Uh, you saw how we went from uh, hunters and gatherers. We went to agriculturalists. Now we're engaged in, I would say, uh, all manner of things, a service industry, light industry. Uh, our First Nation has a business development corporation. Uh, our, we, uh, we have an energy corporation. One of the last things we, uh, I was very excited that we were getting in on before the plug was uh, pulled. Uh, for, those of, for those of you uh, living in Toronto and were aware of the development of uh, Waterfront Toronto uh, and Sidewalk Labs were working very hard to design a, I call it a Googleized city. We were involved uh, with talks there uh, and they were going very well for us uh, and getting involved in that. But of course, uh, Sidewalk Labs and uh, Google, so to speak, has left that waterfront uh, Toronto project behind. And so we're always, always adapting and looking for ways to adapt ourselves further. So we try and be and are a very, very re resilient people. We're still very, very much on the land and in the area, but not too many people uh, know about us. Just, just before I wind up, I wanna talk about a few of our claims with the government. Uh, I guess I'm gonna go back on that or two. Where did we go? Oh, there we are. We still engage in treaty making to this very day, if you want to call it that, we still want to make uh, deals with the crown. Uh, if you look at this map, you'll see where my cursor, if you look around just east of this orange spot, that's the Toronto Purchase Treaty. If you look at that spot, that's the Rouge River Tract, we call it. We have a claim against the government for that. We registered that 2015 is because we never signed off on that as our first, our first nation ever did. Uh, other first nations have signed off on it farther to our, uh, farther to uh, the east of that tract of land. You know them as the Williams Treaty folks. Like I said, I mentioned some of them earlier, uh, Scugog, uh, Hiawatha, first, first nation, Otterville, so on. They signed off on leaving that, uh, part of uh, Ontario. Our First Nation never did, even though it's part of our traditional territory. And so we're talking with that, talking about that uh, right now. So that's one claim we have against the Crown and uh, we'll wait on them to hear about it. Uh, it. It always takes a long time. The other claim we currently have about the ground room uh, with the Crown refers to the land right here, Treaty 22 and 23 lands, these yellow blotches and the uh, brown blotch. Remember I said we parted with those lands and the government said they would uh, sell those lands on our behalf and then use them to, uh, for lack of better words, help us become civilized. Uh, well, like I said, we never have had an accounting of that and we're not sure what they spent them on. So we have a, a, a claim, pardon me, uh, launched against the Crown regarding that, and that's just 2019, I believe. So back to our last claim, which affects Toronto, and it's really interesting for us too, because kind of it's one of these precedent-setting claims. Uh, all of our treaties, and as I said before, there was eight of them, none of them spoke to water except Treaty 23. And Treaty 23, it, it spoke to water because the British wanted to build a bridge across the Credit River. And so water is spoken to. The British wanted the water in that case. But in all of our other treaties, the British never spoke to water. They never spoke to the ownership of water. And so we launched this claim in 2016 uh, for Aboriginal title claim to water, for uh, all water, beds of water, and floodplains on our treaty lands and territory. And so that's working its way through the government uh, processes now, and who knows? Uh, we're a very, very patient people. Uh, I should point out, our First Nation, we just did a study in conjunction with the University of uh, Guelph, 
one of their uh, doctoral uh, candidates. And we surveyed the First Nation. It was asked, what do you want to achieve from the water claim? And it came down to uh, three things. We, uh, we wanted to make a spiritual connection, a cultural connection back to our waters, because like I said, it's only until 1847, our, mo our movement to this location that we lost our connection to water. Uh, so we want that spiritual cultural connection back to water. We still go out and do uh, water ceremonies and so on throughout our territory, but still it's not as it should be, not as it once was. Uh, the other thing we want to do is we have a saying that we want to preserve and conserve water for the next seven generations of our people. Uh, seven generations is just a metaphor for saying forever. So we're very, very much in tune with uh, the current trend of, of, of the settler population to preserving and conserving water. We're very much in favor of that. And we, we, we're, we're very glad that uh, the settler folks are seeing things our way. Third thing that we want to see out of it is that we'd like to be sustained by our waters. All those eight treaties, if you ever take the chance to read them, they're like real estate transactions. I don't know those of you that buy land. Uh, I know I bought a couple lots in uh, Nova Scotia of all places. And I read the land descriptions in them. 400 yards this way, 300 yards that way, 400 yards that way. And basically it's just a land description. Well, that's how our treaties read. They never ever took our rights away from us. Uh, they were silent to our rights. They did not take away our rights to hunt, to fish or gather. And they did not take our rights, our right away to be sustained by our lands and water. Remember, when we entered into the treaties, we thought we were sharing the lands. We thought we would be sustained. But now the lands that encompass Lake Ontario region of, for our people is basically synonymous with the Golden Horseshoe, probably the most heavily uh, populated, industrialized, developed lands in all of Canada. And so one of the things we want to do is in new ways sustain ourselves off our territory. And now we're starting to pay a little more attention. What does it mean to sustain ourselves in the year uh, 20, pardon me, 2021? What does that look like to be sustained on our land? And so that's one of the exciting things that uh, we're looking at now. And that's why we talk about being sustained by our lands and waters in the water claim. It's a right that we have never given up. Same with the right to stewardship and looking after the preservation and uh, conservation of the land. We don't know when this water claim will come through. We're very patient people. Like I said, I'm going back here a little bit, but then I'm going to close off. This is our Toronto Purchase Treaty. It was first negotiated in 18, uh, 1787, pardon me, there are a number of flaws with that treaty. The British actually set it aside themselves in uh, 1794 due to some irregularities. They went to dig out the treaty about 1794 and they all they found was a blank page. They found no description of the land. And what even made the matter worse is that our dotums if you will, the signatures of our chiefs that made the original deal were actually cut off another document and then glued to that uh, bogus piece of paper. So the British threw that deed out, deed uh, treaty out and renegotiated in 1805. And part of it was just out of embarrassment for the British too, because now, uh, they they put York, the capital of Upper Canada, on that land that was of dubious ownership, at least in British eyes. So they had to renegotiate the treaty. 1805, they come to our people and say, let's, uh, let's do a new treaty. And they do the treaty with us. Uh, 
like I said, 1805. But there's a problem with this treaty, the second Toronto Purchase Treaty, because in the 1805 treaty, they, they take Toronto Island, which we would never have given up. We saw it as a place of uh, refreshment, renewal, kind of like a health spa, if you will, a place of uh, sacredness. So they took that and they took, a, took far more land than originally bargained for in the original Toronto Purchase Treaty. So that was a problem for us. And the real problem was they only gave us 10 shillings for that entire orange covered area of land. So 10 shillings. So in 1986, we launched a, a claim against the federal government for the Toronto Purchase Treaty lands. And uh, it was only resolved in 2010. So it took about uh, 24 years for that claim to be resolved. So the water claim, we can wait a long time. I joke with my mother. I said, you and I will probably both be in our graves before the water claim is ever resolved. But we are patient people. We waited 24 years for the Toronto Purchase claim. And that, to be honest, was a bit of a slam dunk slam dunk claim as far as we're concerned. Uh, the water claim, you can tell just the nature of the claim itself, water and the legalities involved with that. Uh, so we, we're patient people, we can wait a long time. We're resilient people, we can, we can last a long time and we can change and we could roll with the times. Uh, like I said, we've went from hunters and gatherers. We went from extinction. There was uh, less than 200 of us by uh, the signing of our last treaties. We're now up to 2,700 band members. Uh, like I said, uh, throughout the world, most of us live in the Golden Horseshoe area, but we're not extinct. We're still here. Uh, and nobody expected us to be here. No one expected us to be as resilient as we once, as we as we uh, as we are. And uh, so it's very. I'm very grateful to be here just for the short time today to acquaint you. And that's all it is is an acquaintance. We've left out uh, scads of uh, scads of things that we could talk about uh, from a Mississauga of the Credit First Nation perspective. And I give this talk to a lot of proponents that want to come on our lands and develop our lands. And I always feel like I'm leaving major, major stuff out. I'm getting resigned to doing that anymore because the history is just so, so broad. Uh, so I invite you, if you ever get a chance to uh, visit our, our territory, visit the new credit First Nation, visit us and see what we're about. and. I ask you, when you're passing through this end of Southern Ontario, think about sharing the land. Think about the spirit of the treaties. Our First Nation still wants to, to engage in the spirit of the treaties. We're still willing to share. And we hope that uh, that uh, Spirit of rest, uh, you know, a, a, a reciprocal relationship will uh, be uh, more firmly uh, be more firmly grasped by both uh, both uh, sides. Uh, so anyway, I'm done for now, but I've been told I can answer questions at this time. So now I'm going to get myself out of the stop share. I think I've done that. Yes. No? Maybe? Yep, I think so. Wonderful. Chi miigwech, Darren. That was that was wonderful. I, I know I learned a lot and all of our all of the folks tuning in uh, on YouTube uh, must have as well. Uh, we, we've got some questions uh, lined up in, in the chat here. Um, so I'm just going to jump right into them. Okay. Um, so the first the first question is uh, coming back to the Reverend Peter Jones. Yeah. Um, they ask, uh, what were the relationships like between individuals like Peter, who had adapted so greatly to settler culture, and then those who lived in, in more traditional ways? Well, at, at least in the Mission Village, those people that wanted to remain largely traditional just went elsewhere. There was no, there was no way for them to carry on when, 
when you think the vast majority, so I'll, I'll be generous and say maybe, oh, 200 of the 220, 30 of us are all pious Christians. Like I said, not a lot of fun. They're not fun people in those days. Uh, and they're abandoning those old ways. None of the old manitous are being paid attention to. New ways of child rearing. Oh, for heaven's sake, you couldn't even dance to fiddle music in those days. So they just left. You have people like my relatives, the Herkimers. They become a, a thorn in Peter Jones's a thorn in the flesh for, for Peter Jones. They're kind of antagonistic to him sometimes, uh, to put it mildly, and they oppose a lot of the things he, do, he does. But even the Herkimers, I have letters from Lawrence Herkimer saying nice things to Peter Jones and uh, thanking him for his help. I have his brother, William Herkimer, becomes a Methodist minister himself and embraces Christianity and becomes a really, I don't think I would have liked him as a clergyman, uh, just because he was so strict and forceful and no drinking, no dancing, you've got to live the upright way. And you can read some of his uh, sermons. And so we really embraced it well. I uh, should say, well, yeah, I guess I, I consider it well. I'm very glad we embraced it. But Peter Jones is a, such a polarizing figure in our with our people today uh not so much in his time eventually that faded away when he dies in the 1850s the whole community is devastated by it and if you ever re i forget which book it is whether it's the uh diary of peter jones where the whole victorian death scene is played out and oh it's just awful and sad and there's First Nations people wailing outside his house in Brant. Oh, it was awful. But today, he's, he, he really comes across, uh, for some of our band members, I, as being a destructive force. Uh, because, yes, he, 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 he nudged us along to Christianity. So we gave up. Oh, we lost our language. We lost our culture. And to all I can say to those people is, we're still here. You know, we were on the verge of extinction. We knew the old ways weren't working for us. And so when Peter Jones and people like Chief Joseph Sawyer uh, moved us along in the other direction, I think he made the right choice. I, I, I just probably gently want to encourage some of our own band members to look at the situ situation. Uh, I really do think the, the choice was between extinction or, you know, moving the other, uh, moving the other way. So polarizing figure, even today. It's, it's really interesting. And uh, he, he, he's such a fascinating figure. And I kind of wonder what, what, what do you think uh, the figure of, of Peter Jones, whether whether one uh, approves or disapproves, what do you think that, that 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 he could teach us about sort of managing multiple or sometimes competing like cultural values? Oh boy, uh, <laughs> that's a big one. It but, is a tough one. I all I can honestly say is he he walked a tight rope. I would not envy him. As, you know, it's. For heaven's sake, the man's dead now. So he's okay now. He can. There's nothing can happen to him anymore. But I think during his lifetime, especially when the Herkimers are getting on his back, and at one time, even to the point the band members don't want him as chief anymore. Oh, we're tired of this Christianity stuff. And the whole movement, what was it, 1840? I guess about 1847 too. When we're thinking about moving, oh, maybe oh, we're in despair because we're going to be homeless. We've got this disaster in our hands, and I think kind of they try to throw him under the bus a bit too. He is going away from his chieftainship, but uh, eventually calmer heads prevailed, and they said, come on back. We want you as our chief. And the funny thing is, uh, what was it? Uh, uh, about 20 years later, 25 years later, his son... Peter Edmund Jones becomes the chief of our First Nation. So his son becomes the chief of our First Nation. And his chief of all things is a medical doctor. He's the first 
Canadian Indian registered as a, uh, as, as a medical doctor. So we got, th got that way. Uh, we're always, one of the things, maybe it's part of the legacy of Peter Jones is that we're willing to embrace, even right down to when uh, we got, uh, it doesn't come across in some of the books about uh, new credit, but we embraced uh, the Lindy, uh, elected councils way, there's one First Nation before us, farther to the east, uh, that embraced elected councils. We threw off the traditional chiefs and said, okay, in 1842, or 18, pardon me, 1872, we're going to elect our chief according to the Indian guidelines. And so we elected our first chief according to government guidelines. John A. Macdonald, of course, was just ecstatic because we're on the road to civilization now. And he commends us for that. We embrace uh, municipal forms of government. So I think one of the legacies of uh, Peter Jones is just that moving forward, always grasping, uh, always grasping the next, the next biggest rung, the next step. Like I said, maybe that's part of us just natural resilience too. I, I don't know, but to me, Peter Jones, he's just, you can't, uh, he's just such a phenomenal person in our history. Uh, if you ever get a chance, you people that are out there watching, uh, read Sacred Feathers, a book by Donald Smith. It'll give you uh, a good overview of the man in his times. Uh, I don't know. I can't say enough about that, that uh, book and what uh, Peter Jones has done. I, I, I checked it out at your recommendation. I can also, uh, I can also in, endorse, uh, endorse Sacred Feathers. Uh, so the, the next question, and we've got a couple uh, that are in line all around this, this, these discussions of treaties, uh, which were, of course, a major oh. aspect of the presentation. So uh, yeah. Principal De Rosier uh, commends you on a, on a great presentation and suggests this is a great way of learning history, but sort of asks about um, the Brant Treaty. And, and she's wondering, like, why the Brant Treaty seems so much smaller than the, the pink territory, which I think was the Toronto purchase uh, in the maps. Um, wh wh why is there such a huge difference in sort of the size of lands that are being exchanged in these, or, or not necessarily uh, exchanged, but appropriated? Right. It's never easy when you talk about treaties and how do you say you exchange the land? Like, because I'm in the 21st century, I always think in terms of ownership, but I know we did not own the land per se. But anyway, specifically the question about the about the Brant Tract. The Brant Tract was uh, was meant for Joseph Brant. He he got the uh, no no. I'm just curious. Is the question about the Brant Tract, the whole six miles, or just the small Brant Treaty? So I think that it's the small sort of like blue sliver, if I'm not mistaken. Okay, yeah, that would be there. the Brant yeah. Treaty. Yeah. So Brant, of course, secured for the Six Nations people the Brant Tract purchase, but he also secured a tract of land for himself around modern day Burlington. And that was a reward from the British government for his personal services during the Crown uh, for, for working for the uh, British cause. Uh, so he granted, I think that's about 2,000 acres of land in modern day Burlington. And once again, it was just for his own personal needs. That's still huge for a man's personal needs. Of course, as it turns out, it comes much of modern Burlington anyway. If those of you are familiar with Brandt, uh, Brandt Hospital in Burlington, you know where it is. And his house is there to this day. But that's the only reason that that land is so uh, the size that it is. Other things like Treaty Number no. Three and the Adjutants Treaty and the Toronto Purchase, it's just a matter of British necessity for for settling the loyalists down. That's all it is. You know, when you think uh, when the loyalists started coming early on, in the early 1800s, all of a sudden you're inundated with 30,000 loyalists. Where do you got to put them? And that you know, I know the territory seems like a lot, but even if you look at the map of southern Ontario, it's not that large, really. It's not that large. It's, yeah. So that's a Brant Tract purchase anyway. Awesome. I think that that kind of clears, uh, clears the, some of the particularities up for sure. Um, the next question is a little bit more, more general, and I think that's a perfect sort of uh, transition. Um, and this, this individual is asking, 
uh, and I think this question came in around the time where we were looking at the the, the relocated sort of reserve uh, land, um, and they're they're wondering like whether the the band was trying to get like one collective title or an individual title for each person. Um, uh, okay. Yeah, uh, the band, and this is what Peter Jones did too when he went over to see Queen Victoria. He wanted. I guess you would call it a collective title because there was still that sense of communal, like I said, ownership again. Uh, nobody was supposed to own the land individually. And that was a, even a fear with the individual colonial government that if we got individual deeds, we would sell them. If each individual First Nation, like my great grandfather, Lawrence Herkimer got a deed to his 200 acres, he just might go off and sell it to whomever, and then they would be without land anyway. So I think for Peter Jones, yes, it was a cumulative, it was for everyone. Though Peter Jones, I gotta tell you, and you might've read this yourself, he did own his own private strip of land at the mouth of the credit, Him, he and his uh, brother, John Jones. So it's a mixed bag there, and he took some heat from those Herkimers again. What are you doing own, owning that land? At the, I thought we were all in this together sort of thing. So, but I think it was to be a collective deed as far as I can tell. But like I said, it never, moot point never happened. Uh, so, yeah. So there, there's there's some some great questions that are taking us in slightly different directions, but I just kind of want okay. to follow up on this on this question uh, yeah. that, that was just asked, and, and maybe just to ask you to to uh, at a at a high level talk about some of the the tensions that exist around owning land. You've, you've mentioned this a couple of times, and I'm wondering like uh, where could you could you lay out for for some of the folks that are watching like what the what the difference between owning land and acting as stewards of the lands are. Yeah, uh, I suppose you mean modern day or way back when? Uh, I suppose you can you can approach it in, in whichever <laughs> way you want. <laughs> yeah, uh, back back then. Well, it's, uh, it's even today when we talk about stewardship, uh, we still believe yes, we we are sharing the land today in a manner from we're all on this piece of land, 4, 000, 4 million acres, pardon me. So we all are responsible for stewarding it wisely. Water, animals, plants, you name it, we're all responsible. But do we ourselves really own it? Uh, no, we don't. We're, we say it's our sacred obligation from the creator to share and look after the land. That's still our responsibility to the creator and that remains to this very day. Owning land, modern day speaking, I don't own it. I don't own anything. Uh, I had to go out of province and I uh, didn't have to go out of province. I went to another province and bought land. That's how I own land. But as a First Nation person, I don't own the land I live on here at New Credit. I can merely occupy it. That's, that's it. And that's sad because like I said, I, I can't take a loan out if I want to improve the property, yeah, I can do it, but I better do it all on my own and uh, I can't sell it except to another band member. Uh, here's an interesting thing, in fact, you know uh, what it costs for buy a house nowadays. Move that same house to a reserve. Your house has probably been devalued probably at least 70, 80%. Same house, but now it's on a reserve. Go figure. Anyway, I don't know. What I'm skating all around this question because I'm not exactly where to go with it. But I still say what our treaties never took away from us, the stewardship of the land, that we have the right to speak out about it. And for a long time, First Nations were the only people speaking out about the land. Good Lord, I still remember that nasty commercial when I was a kid. I don't like it even today. About the Indian crying tears in a garbage-filled lake. You remember that? Maybe you're, you're younger than I'm, so maybe you don't remember it. So maybe it's a, that's a good thing because I'm getting old. But years ago, it used to be that we were seen as these 
how, how do I say that without being too insane? Uh, but this way, we were just seen as being adorable people that looked after the forest and the woods and all that. And no one else was looking after them. You know, the, the, yeah, if you ever get a chance, you'll see it, uh, the commercial with the Indian with a tear walk canoeing on a really disgusting lake or river or whatever it was. But it was just goes to show that we were always been associated with being stewards. And for a long time, we didn't have any allies in it. Now, of course, we have so many allies in it. And fun, funny thing, even the allies amongst themselves don't know how to agree what is the proper stewardship of the land. One conservation area says this, another conservation area says that. We, as First Nations, say, complicated mess. I'm glad I don't have to deal with the environment. I'm, I just stick with the history stuff. I don't mess around with the environmental stuff in the department. I, I don't want to do that. Oh. That's fair. It's it's a it's a a big uh, a big issue for sure. Um, the the next question actually kind of gets gets at some of the some of the same themes that you're talking about here. And this this person is is saying that that colonial authorities sound insincere in historic treaty making conduct, and they're wondering whether this diminishes the legacy of those treaties as the basis of sort of modern uh, nation to nation dealings uh, between the the First Nation and the Canadian government. Well, the treaties were certainly condescending. I, 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 never, I don't think there's been a single treaty done with clean hands as far as I'm concerned. There was always some, as far as I'm concerned, uh, what do you call it, some deception somewhere along the line. And that's, if not out and out hatred sometimes, especially for those last treaties. Uh, another great grandfather of mine, you know him, read of him, Chief Joseph Sawyer was asked, what did we get out of Treaty 23? Well, we got a uh, roasted ox, a keg of whiskey, and a drunken frolic. That's all we got out of it. And so, and I think those last treaties, that was, the, people took advantage of our diminished nature. Huh. Now, as far as today, modern day interpretation of the treaties, of course, for First Nations, we're still trying to right those wrongs as best we can. And we're limited by what we can do. Uh, I would like to, I, I don't know what the water claim holds for us. I'd love to see they say to us, you will give, be given the ultimate say over the waters in your treaty lands and territory. And you can hold us to guidelines and stewardship and so on. But the government will have other interests, other things that they want to take care of. And let's face it, there's only, like I said, 2,600 of us nowadays, 2,700 of us nowadays. There's how many people in the Golden Horseshoe itself? Six million or something of that. So government has to look after their thoughts too. Uh, I, I don't always know what to do with treaties nowadays. Like I say, it's really important what the treaties did not take away. The treaties, like I said, I read them as a real estate transaction nowadays. Go from point A to point B and go west and go south and go east, and it frames in a tract of land. And that's, if you read our treaties, they're one page, page and a half. So I tell people it's really what they did not take away our right to govern ourselves. They did not take away our right to our, who our band members are. They did not take a right away to sustain ourselves on the land. They did not take away to hunt, fish, and gather. I say, for a, my personal opinion is, we still, we don't have treaty rights as Mississaugas of the credit, is the way I look at it. We have indigenous rights. We have the rights we moved into the territory with. And the fact that we've been forced by development in our land to retreat from those rights. Uh, I think it's a hard, it's been a hard fight all the way. It still is, of course. At least nowadays, people have to consult with us and talk to us before they're going to do anything on our lands. But before, people never asked us anything. They just did it. And that's why you probably have such huge development around the Golden Horseshoe. We were not asked. We were not asked, despite the fact that we gave up that land uh, but of course, the spirit of the Mississaugas by the time the last treaties were done was broken anyway. Uh, you know, we hung our, we could hang our head in despair. And like I said, we, we came back from extinction. I think for us, that was just a major achievement. And now, of course, we're moving forward. 
moving forward. So I think this, this is a really interesting uh, direction uh, and perspective that you share, because I think that um, oftentimes we, we hear uh, phrases like, we are all treaty people. Oh, um, and, yeah. and folks will point to uh, things like the friendship belt that, that you shared at the start of the presentation or the geschwenta, like two row wampum, yeah, or the dish yeah. with one spoon. And they'll, they'll, they'll use that as the basis to sort of uh, uh, make this claim that we're all treaty people. What, what, do, you, what do you think about that? In reality, we all are treaty people. I don't like the saying because it's used everywhere nowadays and not taken seriously, but we are treaty people. There's a reason you are living in Toronto. I'm assuming that's where you're coming from. Toronto right now, living in Toronto proper. And that's because your people made a deal with my people. Uh, and like I said, there's no meeting of the minds. There's no meeting of the minds today, even for that matter. I'm sure, well, I don't know if you own your house or not, but you're living on a plot of land. No. I know people living in Toronto, I feel sorry for you, for you folks. I can't imagine buying land in there, but you're living on a plot of land, full ownership of it, and we're supposed to be sharing it. And I'm here, don't own my land, and I'm stuck on little tiny new credit first nation. So we are treaty people, we are that. But that's one of my pet peeves nowadays too. Uh, I'm speaking for myself, not for the First Nation, even though I work for them. I got to be careful and I got to be somewhat more respectful than I want to do, want to be, uh, because I keep hearing about this dish with one spoon treaty. And nowadays it's become a metaphor, not by my First Nation and not by other Anishinaabe, Ojibwe, Mississauga First Nations, but it's become a symbolism oh, we're all on the land and we're stewards of the land and we all got to work and care for it. I'm all for those sentiments. I love, yes, you're on the land. I think you got a responsibility. We got we to be wise stewards. But the problem I hate is that they're, they're attaching those sentiments to a treaty that was not about sharing and caring for the land. For heaven's sake, it was a peace treaty negotiated in 1701 so that my people, the Anishinaabe people, the Mississaugas and the other folks, our folks, would not kill the Haudenosaunee people when we came across them. You know, and there's even, you know, oh my God, it, it's such, uh, it really alarms me. And I tell people sometimes, and I work on a lot of land acknowledgements as part of my job. I tell them, don't use the dish with one spoon. Don't try and take something that was First Nation and attach it to a modern day sentiment. We like the sentiment, no doubt about it, like I said, but don't attach a treaty to it or a friendship agreement to it or something like that. It just isn't, uh, it isn't right. And like I said, we see it as an agreement between ourselves and the Haudenosaunee people. All of a sudden, who invited the settlers into the treaty? Who, who it, it sounds kind of crass, but who invited you guys in is, is kind of, I know that's kind of nasty and saying, but like I said, I'm speaking to myself. So if my chief is out there, don't fool me up and give me heck later on. I'm only speaking for myself. Uh, the other problem I have too is things like uh, the two row wampum. It's, it's not a big problem I have, but I see it as an aspirational thing. You, 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 you've seen the belt uh, two, two stripes going on a, on a wampum belt, on a purple wampum belt, I believe it is purple and white, and each stripe representing a canoe, uh, well, pardon me, one stripe representing a First Nations canoe, another representing a British ship. And the two are going on separate paths in parallel, never to cross over to each other, which really was never to, meant to interfere with each other. And the beads represented uh, peace, friendship and respect. Uh, that's an aspirational treaty. It's not there yet. I say, okay, we can deal with settlers in the terms of uh, that wampum belt on the basis of uh, friendship, peace, and respect. But it's aspirational. We're not there by a long shot. And we have, if, we, if you're serious, carry out the spirit of the treaties, that original sharing thing. Uh, 
And like I said, well, I, I can't say who invited the settlers to the degree because really it is a Haudenosaunee belt and it was first set up with the English, or pardon me, the Dutch, and then the English later on. So in that sense, the settlers were invited, but I, I view it as aspirational. That's the way I say it. Not there by, by a long shot yet. Well, I, I, I can only speak for myself, but I, I appreciate uh, your, your uh, candid uh, sharing. Sometimes, uh, sometimes hard truths are part of this, this process. Um, uh, the next, the next questioner is is also grateful for, for sharing all of all of your thoughts, and and they're wondering. Um, uh, well, their question is is that there there are lots of nations where younger folks are talking a lot about trying to to learn traditional ways and rediscover language. Um, and so, given everything you've said about how how the Mississauga has historically embraced new ways and the village mission, and, and after uh, this person is curious about where uh, younger Mississaugas are now in terms of. Uh, embracing and navigating both both uh, contemporary and traditional culture. Oh boy, yeah. It's a bit of a tough one for us uh, because of course, when we embraced Christianity, we, we really embraced it and we, we really jettisoned everything. Uh, for example, we haven't had a traditional Ojibwe speaker on our First Nation probably since, I'm guessing 1880, 1890. So the language has been completely gone for years. We have no native speakers on our First Nation. But in the last several years, I'm guessing 20 now, and I have to ask one of my colleagues about that. We have just started, uh, in the last 20 years, started language teaching. So many of our young people at our school are learning the Ojibwe language. And so, my, one of my colleagues has a son that's uh, in high school now. Uh, she tells me that he and his friends can prattle on quite nicely in Ojibwe now. So it's making a comeback. Uh, but we're going to have to look to the young people to, to lead the way, just as it was our young people that led the way learning, reading, writing, arithmetic back in 1826. The young people did it, then they taught their parents. The same is going to happen to us here. It's the young people that are learning it and are going to teach it to, to the older folks. Uh, in terms of actual culture, there are there is more of a comeback learning traditional ways. Uh, and the fact of the matter is we have to uh, import people from other places to teach us these ways. We have to reach out to our other Mississauga nations other Ojibwe nations to teach us about the way things were. Uh, and so that's a bit of a difficulty even today because uh, I, I'm not always sure we know what the original was anymore. We're so far removed from pre-contact -con, pre times that I'm sure things have become so blurred and erased through the years. Uh, I don't, I don't know, uh, does any, do people hunt with old fashioned bows and arrows from the 1600s? Or do they use modern bows and arrows with pulleys and counterweights? And, you know, I don't think it's something we can ever really recapture ever again. We can learn from what we what we read and what some people have brought down to us, but it's a tough go. But that's like every culture too, you know. Uh, you know, my my dad is a Dutchman. I am removed from Dutch culture pretty much. Once in a while, I eat some Dutch food, but would I want to go back to old-fashioned Dutch ways of, oh, good lord, four hundred years ago? Do we even know what they were? We have an idea. But it's kind of like putting toothpaste back in the tube. Once it's out, you're never going to get back ever again. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of an odd person. I have Dutch heritage and First Nations heritage. I like to say I'm a Dutch Calvinist. A Dutch, Dutch First Nation Mississauga Calvinist. I'm, I'm a rare breed. A rare breed. I, I still kind of tend toward the Methodist side, but I'm a Calvinist at heart. <laughs> well, I appreciate uh Appreciate you uh, sh sharing your, your very unique perspectives. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of interested in calling back to, to what, you, what you were saying uh, in, in the question uh, just before this one about um, uh, sort of 
how we're not there yet. Uh, and, and I'm wondering, uh, without sort of asking you to solve the world, I'm oh. wondering if you can think of some ways that communities like Massey College or institutions like the University of Toronto should change existing ways or develop new practices to sort of more effectively enact the calls to action of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission or, or more generally just better uphold their treaty obligations relative to the Mississaugas of the Credit. Uh Right. I, I think that's probably true. Holds true for a lot of us. I love land acknowledgements nowadays where people actually go out and acknowledge that they're on First Nations land and uh, people that uh, live there first. I believe uh, in your land acknowledgement, you mentioned the Huron Wendats. You mentioned the uh, Adnasani. Uh, and you mentioned, of course, us, the Mississaugas of the Credit. So you've mentioned the traditional landholders. You've mentioned the people that are traditionally stewarding the land. And you mentioned us as treaty holders because we made the deal, so to speak. I think that every First Nation wants to feel that they have contributed to the march of history. And we have too, Canadian society. And I think that's where we're left out so much. We're still, we're here, but we're left out of everything. We're not seen. So I'd like to see that. I'd like to see... First Nations history taught more than it is in schools, be that high school, university, call, community college, I don't call it community college anymore, it's just me being old, uh, college, uh, grade school. I was a grade school teacher for years. You know, I spent two weeks talking about Indigenous history. Uh, two weeks when I taught history grade in those grades. And I had to cover all of Canada in two weeks. So a, a day and a half for the prairies, a day and a half for the mountain region, a day and a half for the Eastern woodlands, a day and a half for the uh, maritime region. I want people to actually know about the people whose land they're on. So you should know in Toronto, you should know about the Mississaugas. Uh, if you're in uh, Vancouver, you should know about the Salish shore. Uh, whatever, try, uh, if you're in Calgary, the Blackford or the Crow or whoever. Uh, so I think that's very important. So I think education, there's no substitute for it. And I think if we start young, it'll, it'll have that effect. It'll go through time and build upon itself. I like initiatives where there is, a, uh, which I don't know if it's the University of Toronto or is, is it Odds Good Hall that now that you must take a Aboriginal law course. One of the big law schools has that now that you must know something about Aboriginal law. And I think that's important. Uh, and I think the best, I think the other thing you can do, everybody is facilitate meeting somehow between settler folks and ourselves. It sounds so silly, but uh, you ask me if there's questions that people always ask me. People ask everything when they come to my office here at DOCA simply because they have no relationship with the First Nations. They don't know First Nations people. And what they do have is oftentimes ne negative stereotypical stuff. Oh, they're, they're poor drunken Indians and they're angry and they're mean and you know all kinds of nasty things. All those typical stereotypes or I get the other things that were all adorable people of the forest that uh, you know that, what was that Sir Walter Scott book? Uh, the Last of the Mohicans, was it Chingich Cook? You know that, well, maybe you haven't read it. It's been years since I've read it. Where the Indian is the man of the forest and knows the ways of the forest. And I, I want people to treat us as modern people too. We're not stuck back in some time frame. I'm not stuck back as a hunter or gatherer or something like that. No, I'm a fully modern person like uh, you are. I, a different form of government, different relationship with the government, different relationship with the land. But we're modern people too. And uh, I want that embraced as well. So those are just some of those things. I don't know how that always works concretely though. But I think little exercises like today where people can get out and hear and learn a little bit because, like I said, most people don't even know the Mississaugas exist. Part of that's our fault for not being assertive enough, too, though, I suppose. I suppose. 
Well, I think that, that this, those are uh, really, really great and insightful for directions to, for everyone uh, listening to think about. Um, uh, so as we're, we're coming towards the end, but uh, just as a, as a last question, I thought it'd be interesting to hear about where, what the trajectory of, of the Mississauga of the Credit First Nation is. You mentioned your uh, participation with the Waterfront Toronto yeah, developments. Yeah. Uh, what, do, what do you think uh, some of the, the, some exciting things that are going on or what the future of the First Nation looks like? I, I continue to see us evolving in a, in a very positive way, of course. Uh, we mentioned that, uh, for example, our la own language is coming back. There's some growth in culture now, so that's a very positive thing. I think, uh, like through the exercise today, again, too, people are starting to know who we are and are reaching out to us. And I think we want to reach back and, uh, like I said, restore the spirit of those treaties. And we're getting more and more out there. Like I said, like you mentioned, Waterfront Toronto too. We want to be out there being involved with our business corporations. Our, uh, I think I told you we have an energy company. We're always looking for ways to evolve ourselves. Uh, not to become uh, like everybody else. Not to become... Uh, we want to remain our own nation, put it this way. We want to remain our own nation, our own people, but we also want to take our place along beside every other people. And I think part of that is engaging with them, whether it's business or social events or whatever. I'm hoping we learn more and more that way. And I think we are, because most of our band members now live off reserve. Only two thirds of us actually uh, pardon me, only one third of us actually lives on re the reserve. Two thirds of us are elsewhere and we're, I think we're taking our place out there and I hope we're being more vocal about it too. Because for a long time, I think, I think this is what the Truth and Reconciliation recommendations do, is because there's a certain amount of, uh, do I say, it? there's a certain amount of shame on our part where we have been shamed we have not been treated respectfully as we probably, well, as we should have been rightfully so. Uh, and sometimes we've just, I wonder sometimes if we felt too sorry for ourselves. I think we are, as our people have to go out there and really willingly embrace what has to be embraced, be assertive as we can be out in the world and realize that we're not just passive people that we're, that we're out there, we're gonna act on the world. The world is not just going to act on us. I know these are all vague nebulous things. I don't know how they'll play out, but I keep saying, I don't want us as a first nation to ever feel sorry for ourselves. I want us to go out there and be proud of our achievements and accomplishments and go out and get more now. That sounds vaguely settler-like actually going out there and getting more. But I don't think it's bad in this case. I, I tend to agree. T. Miigwech, Darren, I am so grateful for you taking the time to share, uh, to share your knowledge uh, and your experiences with us here today. Uh, and thanks to everybody who tuned in. Uh, I'd, I'd just like to make a, a quick uh, plug for a workshop that we've got going on, uh, again, in partnership with the Mississauga of the Credit First Nation uh, on uh, language, an introduction to Anishinaabe Moen coming up on April 8th. Uh, folks uh, in the community will see that going out uh, by, via email. But uh, until then, uh, I just wish uh, you a fantastic evening, Darren, and uh, a great evening to everyone watching. Thanks again. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye.